some things are just facts of life. Like deploying operating systems is hard. And deploying thousands of operating systems and having them all behave in the same at the end of the day despite changes, problems, and time is even harder. Those are true facts. You can look them up. As far back as 2003 for Nix OS and the early 2010s for Endless OS and Chrome OS, these distros were all pretty good at solving the problem already. Nix with its language abstraction and package management, Endless with its unbreakability, and Chrome OS with its stubborn immutability. The problem that immutability in all of its forms tries to solve is really that traditionally the system, after it's installed, is kind of unpredictable. People do all kinds of things in all sorts of orders after they start using it. A package swap here, a configuration file change there. And that means even if there are guardrails, software and configurations on two systems that are meant to be identical have somehow always drifted away from each other. It leads to the age-old question of most distributions out there. Why does one Debian system upgrade to the next major version just fine, but another Debian system that's supposed to be identical fail? Colin Walters, after researching in this field for years and a few failed attempts at solving the problem for himself and Red Hat, knew these problems all too well. He had looked into the way Nix and Chrome OS were doing things and noted they weren't for him but in 2012, stumbled upon a set of ideas that fixed the delivery part of the equation. It was called OS Tree, but he needed a workbench, a place to test the delivery methods he'd been cooking up. For that, he'd been tinkering with something called Gnome Continuous, which used Open Embedded to create the base system. Walters described OS Tree as a magic formula. And there's nothing revolutionary in it, really. But it's a combination of things that do work. That combination had a lot to do with trees, obviously. Or in other words, pre-compiled sets of packages that were named and immutable. This meant that not only could you tell what state one machine was in, you could apply that state to an entirely different machine just by knowing its name. And if you upgraded one system one day, and another in a week to the same named tree, you'd essentially have the same system. What's even better is that you could upgrade from a server without a GUI to a workstation with a GNOME desktop by downloading a new tree and rebooting into it. If you decided it wasn't for you, you could switch back to the old server tree and get on with things. While all this OS tree work is getting shown at various conferences and shows over the next month, in parallel, Core OS sees its first public release in October of 2013. This distro is a response to the growing need for systems that are streamlined for container workloads, namely Docker, which was released in March of the same year. Something reliable, lightweight, and extremely scalable. That was CoreOS, and it was a hit. Even Red Hat officially got in on the trend with official inclusion of Docker with RHEL 6.5 the following month. This all becomes more and more relevant real soon, I promise. Because, as it turns out, not only was Red Hat including Docker support in its main RHEL product, CoreOS had the whole place buzzing with the lightweight container host idea. Project Atomic was the answer. But it wasn't a distro itself. In April 2014, Project Atomic was announced to a ton of interest and questions as a project that would bring together already existing technologies and create standards, guidelines, and best practices. That meant Kickstart, SE Linux, and Cockpit, too. But it wouldn't be a party without OS Tree. This is part of how the project got its name Atomic, One Piece Systems, Identical all pulled together by the RPM-flavored OS tree known as, you guessed it, RPM OS tree. The actual distro building was left to the actual distro projects, like Fedora. And they did. The Atomic Host comes in. 
Also, as soon as the project was announced, instructions to build your own atomic host on top of Fedora 20 were available. Then, CentOS, the RHEL clone Red Hat partnered with earlier in 2014, began the journey to atomic host as well. This newly built project with distros along for the ride was really starting to make some progress. All the testing paid off, and in July, you didn't need to build your own anymore. At least not unless you wanted to. A Fedora Atomic Host installable ISO was available to download and use, built straight from Rawhide. And while Rawhide still held the move fast and break things attitude, the immutability brought on by the project, and more importantly, RPM OS tree, made this much less of a rough ride. In August, alpha builds for CentOS Atomic Host were available now too. And in December, Fedora 21 releases with Atomic Host images. To cap off the trifecta, in March of 2015, Red Hat Enterprise Linux Atomic Host released based on RHEL 7. Fedora 22 Atomic Host releases in May, and after two solid releases, the Atomic Project and Atomic Host were full speed ahead. And in July, a feature being worked on for over a year, now called package layering, was introduced. It allows a user of the Atomic Host to add normal RPM packages on top of the tree, or a mutable part of the system. For instance, all the stuff in RPM Fusion. Fedora 23 through 28 Atomic Hosts came and went including bi-weekly releases, with all the benefits of a newer, more updated Fedora, while the Project Atomic group continued to iterate on and integrate things like Cockpit, OS Tree, and Docker. While all this work was ongoing, XDG App, a software deployment and package management system, sprung up. It allowed another avenue for getting software on a system that may or may not be immutable. In 2016, this hard-to-say technology was renamed. Flatpak. I told you it'd be relevant, and here it is. The core OS Docker platform that Fedora, CentOS, and RHEL Atomic Host were ostensibly competing against this whole time was acquired by Red Hat in January. It would soon become Red Hat Core OS. This really spelled the death of the Atomic Hosts, but honestly, only the CentOS and RHEL variants. The Fedora flavor would live on as Team. Silver Blue. The name, settled on in April, had been thoroughly vetted for about two months. Everything from tree names, atoms, and landscapes were considered, and the number one reason it was chosen? The domain name and handles around the web were available. Of course. <laughs> but also, the color scheme aligned with Fedora. The team can be dropped to integrate better name wise, and, well, Team Silver Blue was just plain fun to say. It was almost called Silverleaf. But the name was not meant to be. The FAQ notes, Our favorite choice for a project name was Silverleaf, but that sadly did not work out. We just couldn't quite let go of the leaf. You could also say that Silver Blue is a new leaf on Fedora's OS tree. Team Silver Blue was officially introduced to the world on May. 4th, 2018, but had been coalescing for a while before this point by Owen Taylor, Matthias Clausen, and Sanja Bonnick. Their mission statement, Team Silverblue aims to present an overarching developer desktop story by combining an image-based OS with good support for container-focused workflows. Sharing similar patterns with the server side will reduce the learning curve for developers, increase their productivity, and grow mindshare for the entire ecosystem. Across the site was a quote. Atomic Workstation is dead. Long live Silverblue. The idea was to take the Atomic host based on Fedora Workstation and turn it into a first-class product. And not just that, its true aspiration was to replace the Fedora workstation offering as we knew it. No more DNF updates for anybody. It would be RPM OS tree upgrades all the way down. Oh, and no, 
and flat packs and layering and rollbacks. But for now, they had to get the first real silver blue, 29, out the door. And it happened. On October 30th, 2018, Fedora 29 was released with a silver blue variant. Its headlining feature was Fedora Toolbox, a utility that provides containers with which devs can do development. Matthew Miller on Fedora Magazine noted that Silver Blue uses the same technologies we're using for CoreOS and IoT to make a consistent container-focused desktop environment. But by the end of the year, Team Silver Blue was dead. Sort of. Mostly in the domain area. The Fedora Council made the decision to tighten things up regarding naming and where sites for projects would be hosted. This meant no more teamsilverblue.org or silverblue.fedoraproject.org. Oh, and don't go to the first one. It's squatters, as far as the eye can see. In 2019, like clockwork, and exactly six months after 29, Fedora 30 and the silver blue variant were released with the newly added ability to layer on the NVIDIA driver for all those folks needing the proprietary stuff. And flat packs were available out of the box. And in November, Silverblue 31, with GNOME 3.34, the upgrade to C Groups V2, and better integration with Podman. In April of 2020, Silverblue 32 was upgraded to GNOME 3.36, saw the early out of memory manager, and flat packs are beginning to show up installed out of the box. Silverblue 33 in October got GNOME 3.38, the swap to the ButterFS file system, and Nano. The best terminal text editor out there is the new default. In April of 2021, Silverblue 34 survived the huge leap to GNOME 40. The swapping of Pulse Audio for Pipewire and Z Standard compression enabled for slimmer on disk systems. With Silverblue 35 in November, we got GNOME 41, mobile power modes like Power Saver and Wire Plumber for easier pipe wire management. This is also the release that introduced Fedora Kinoite, the first addition to the lineup. It uses KDE Plasma instead of GNOME, but most everything else under the hood is the same, just like in Workstation. In May 2022, Silverblue 36 is released with GNOME 42, added a separate subvolume for VAR, and moved NVIDIA users to Wayland by default, with very mixed results. Later in the year, November, Silverblue 37 is released with GNOME 43. Sysroot is made read-only and lots of small changes. April again, and it's 2023. Silverblue 38 is out with GNOME 44, quicker shutdown time, and another new immutable desktop, er, window manager to use. Sway. It's called Saracia. Other unofficial desktops sprang up too. Sodalite, based on the Pantheon desktop, and Bazite for the Steam Deck. Surely there are others in the works, and they're all just an RPM OS tree rebase away. Enjoy Fedora Silverblue, and happy rebasing to everyone. Catch these and other great topics as they unfold on our subreddit or on our news channel on Discord. And let me, but you can also keep up with us on Mastodon or Twix, Twix, T Twitter X, X, X Twitter. The bird site? That thing. I call it the bird the site. Birds the bird site. Um, <laughs> mm. uh, and if you like the inline chattery, uh, you like to, to talk to me, Dan, or anybody else in the entire community, we got Telegram, Matrix, and of course, Discord. But if you like live streams, you know, ones where I fail to compile <laughs> Gentoo, we have Twitch too. 